As many Australians as ever come down among the sheltering ponds, 73,000 arrived last year. Yet they're increasingly a collection of transients rather than a colony. Stays are shorter. Clubs for visitors are declining. Magazines for visitors have suspended publication. Australian pubs are fewer in number. Uh, this immigration bill, I think, has put the, put the card. Pol politics, I think, you, you know, I mean, let's face it, uh, they make it pretty hard for a fella to come over and get a job, work permits, etc. Oh. you know, it's just pretty difficult. Well, how's your trade going? If, if the number's falling off, is it, has that been affected at all? Uh, no, I, we, we still keep pretty busy. I mean, if an Aussie wants a beer, a cold beer, you know, he knows where to get it. When I say it's, it's dwindling, I mean, Earl's Port itself used to be really packed with Australians and Kiwis, etc. You know. But it's, uh, the numbers have definitely declined, yeah. Australia House, where the visitors arrive in dribs and drabs, remains as busy as ever. Here, the Australian skirt length going up meets the English skirt length going down. Here, the track trendy and the graziest thorn proof take refuge from a London in which they're both equally out of fashion. Australia House embalms a long outdated concept of empire in its massive mausoleum. But even so, the visitor can still imagine himself back home. So bad is the food, so friendly the atmosphere. For the invading armies, Australia House is only a bridgehead. It's a place for them to pick up supplies, to regroup, and then to fan out, to conquer a new world. And this is the world they've got to conquer. There's culture over here in the Festival Hall by the gross. There's money in the city by the ton. And for sex, there's Soho, which is a sex supermarket compared with King's Cross. But who are the Australians who come? Who are the people who come to conquer this new world? The immigration form asks them in peremptory fashion for object of visit. Now, if it was answered honestly, some at least would put sex, drugs or culture. But even the things they do put provide as useful a classification as any. Shops, offices and schools, the world of the working holiday contingent. They're mainly girls. Australia exports its sons in wartime, but in peacetime, they stay at home to acquire sections, houses, qualifications. The girls go overseas to acquire culture and to collect countries. This is the Genghis Khan approach to culture, or to anything else that interests. It's ripped up bodily and taken back. The Australians cluster together, viewing the natives as nasty, British and short. When all's been seen, it's home. Home to catch up in the race for husbands. Home to catch up in the race for money. 575 students came to England last year. Students like Gary Evans, and his wife, Merrin. I mean, one does have this tremendous sense of isolation in Australia. It's 12,000 miles away from, from anything. And uh, that this is where the action supposedly is. And I, th I think this you know, impression is justified after being here now for a period of time, certainly where the, the cultural action is. I mean, politically, England's posturing tends to be you know, almost as absurd as that of Australia. I mean, the real action politically is, of course, in the States. But, but there is a sense of being in England, in Europe, mm. right in the centre of one, one's whole sort of background and heritage. But so do you think you're see. gaining by being here something you couldn't possibly have got in Australia, uh, just in the sense of teaching and the academic side of it? Well, certainly the, the academics are superb here. And the, the whole nature of the system, where there's far more sort of personal contact with mm. one's tutor, the, the hourly session each week, um, rather than the sort of lecture room format, and one, one does feel some sort of sense of communication. And there's the whole sort of atmosphere of Oxford, um, the big names that come along to, to give lectures that you can go and, and talk to afterwards. People, you know, would never come within Cooey of Australia. This is the nice thing about the place. What, what happens very often with uh, people who've been here, I've seen it happen on occasions, is that the, the period in Britain has, in a sense, spoiled them for going back to Australia. Do you think that's likely in your case? It'd be very hard to be satisfied um, going back to Australia. I mean, my, my reaction to the whole business about going back is that, rather like Augustine's, you know, God give me chastity and continence, but not yet. I think it's a sensible thing to do, ultimately, to go back to Australia. Mm. Um, mainly because, as an individual, one feels that, you know, you can do all sorts of things that would be impossible to do in a much larger pond here. Like what? Uh, we'll help to do something about dragging Australia, kicking and screaming culturally into the 70s, helping to do something about um, you know, promoting more sensible attitudes to, to Asia and so on. I mean, my ultimate ideal is, is producing in Australia something like a khaki-coloured continent, you know. I mean, well, well, the stimulus for this has got to come from somewhere. One, one can never sort of feel a sense of achievement, I don't think, in England. The place is just too big and too tight and too full of, of sort of middle-classy intellectuals. Mm. 
Some Australians aspire to high society, but others head for the underground. Why do you think it is that Australians are most kind of the high priests of the underground here? Well, um, I think it's the expatriates, not so much Australians, but the expatriates in London who become the high priests of the so-called underground in, in London. Because I think it's because they're alienated from their from their background, and they have to establish themselves in in somewhere like London, and uh, they're not English. I mean. There's a great gulf between English people and Australian people, and Australians are never totally accepted in London. You can get very, very close, but ultimately there's a gap. And think, I think to bridge that gap, you do things, you know, you create things, you sort of force yourself upon, upon, uh, upon someone, somewhere like London, and you make your mark in some very, very creative way. I think that's what it is. You have to sort of make that extra push. You can't just sit back and be accepted. You've got to, to um, you know, make yourself accepted. It's the only way to, sort of, to get to the English, I think. The underground, the dental profession, educational and cultural fields. There's a congested arboreal slum of Australians at the top of so many trees in Britain. It's a wonder the natives don't get restless. The situation's changing as the growth of Australia and the impact of the immigration laws cut down the drift to Britain. Yet at this moment, the 40 or so thousand Australians who've made their careers here are one of the last and perhaps one of the greatest benefits of empire. Well, the British might get Earl's Court back, but I think they'll have a little more difficulty winning back Wimbledon. And that's it for another week. Until next weekend, it's goodbye from Four Corners. Mm -hmm.